Australia now own the full set of ICC silverware. And if you put stars around your logo for like everything that you've won, I think Australia is going to start needing bigger shirts. It took the men until 1987 to win their first big shiny ICC thingy. That was the ODI World Cup, which was played in whites, where England had a real chance at winning until Mike Gatting played a reverse sweep and Australia got off the mark there. They've since added four more of those. In 2006, they won their first Champions Trophy. Until that point, it was hard to work out if they actually took it seriously as an ICC event at all. That might also be Damian Martin's least elegant push. They went back to back on this one as well and ended up wearing white jackets. No one's sure why they wore those, but they've won two. The World T20 they didn't really fully engage in when it began, but when they did, they didn't actually go that much better. But in 2021, they turned up in the UAE with Mitch Marsh as their number three. Then they dropped him. Then they reinstated him and he ended up helping them win the final. And now there is the World Test Championship, winning this on their second attempt, which oddly means that this is the quickest they have ever conquered an ICC event. It also means that they now own exactly one of everything, like a middle-class dad, the first team to ever win the four different ICC tournaments. Of course, that might depend on how you think about major tournaments because they haven't yet won a men's Commonwealth gold. Shout out to Sean Pollock's Mary Group, who are still the reigning champions over there but Australia win at cricket a lot. However, they did not win the WTC last time. In fact, it was a slow over race that ultimately cost them. Though maybe the better way to say it is that the points that they lost would have actually made a big difference in the end. Before that though, there were actually other issues. They celebrated very hard when retaining the Ashes in England, which was a great effort, of course. It was also clear watching them in the last test that they were not quite switched on. The players have basically said the same ever since. And it was a twofold error because they didn't win the Ashes, and then they also let a poor England team steal their WTC points. The Bangladesh tour was called off because Australia was not wanting to travel during COVID. It depends on how you look at all that, of course. Bangladesh were pretty good at home around that period, and so maybe Australia would have actually lost points had they played in that, but we'll never know. The one that was most important was when they faced the depleted Indian lineup at home. That was a real opportunity of getting a lot of points. Losing that series was obviously the worst result, but from a points perspective, only getting a single win and a draw out of a home series really set them back. But they were still good enough to finish an extremely close third and had the same win-loss ratio as New Zealand, but with two extra draws. But you look at this and you can see that they were pretty much still part of the top three teams at that point. The only real difference from the first cycle to the second is that New Zealand and even India dropped off a little bit. Australia improved, but really the other two were not as good due to injuries and retirements. Also, it's worth noting that Australia had some I don't know, good fortune when it came to this particular run. Pakistan had a great World Test Championship schedule and then decided to make wickets at home that were basically impossible for them to get any wins on. And then they doubled down on that by playing some really poor cricket. Both of these things would go on to help Australia because they got a 1-0 series win out of it, but also Pakistan weren't making a run. A very similar thing happened to England as well. Their form was utterly terrible during the important part of this WTC. And also Australia played them in five tests at home. Again, that is the daily double. England aren't in the WTC and they gifted Australia extra points by being so miserable. And finally, it was India's collapse in the third test that really helped Australia's position. At that point, it was looking a little bit shaky and Sri Lanka had a very good chance of coming from nowhere to steal a spot in the final. By beating India in that match, Australia ensured they had a chance at the mace in the final. And remember why that happened as well. India were clearly the far better team in their conditions, but they made their wickets favour bowlers so much that it actually reduced it from a game of skill to more of a game of chance and the Indian batters stuffed up twice and Australia snuck through the hole. Having said that, they were probably the better team in this cycle than India, who were not quite as sharp as they were in the previous one. But things that happened in India certainly played a role in Australia being so good. Like the Aussies didn't have Hazelwood, but India didn't have Bumrah, Pan, Ayer or KL Rahul. The last new are not as important, but might have been a factor, but you cannot replace players like Bumrah and Pant very easily. Whereas Australia had a like-for-like -like mini Josh just sitting on the shelf for about 10 years waiting to be selected. Talking about selection, India didn't use Ashwin against the Australian bunch of left-handers on a pitch where he has some experience as a touring professional. He averages 19 here with 10 wickets in first-class cricket. It's not a lot, but he knows the ground. Being that Taku had a decent game, that was mitigated a little bit. Of course, Umesh didn't. And I get all the issues with why they would drop Ashwin, but it's not how I would have set this team up. And certainly when this pitch did flatten out, Ashwin would have been a very handy cricketer to have. And maybe it was made worse by the fact that India didn't particularly use the new ball well. They got favorable conditions early on, but Australia just sort of fought through that. 
But clearly Australia always had an advantage in English conditions over India, especially when Bumrah wasn't playing. Even more so when this test was being played at the Oval, and even more so when the Oval had pace and carry. And by the way, none of this suggests that Australia isn't a deserving winner, but they certainly had a good run in this cycle. And what they did with that fortune was pretty special. They were the best team with the bat. There was not even a question on that one. And remember that they also played on a couple of fun wickets in this Indian trip as well. And we're used to seeing Australia quite high up this list, as historically it's been easier to score runs here. That wasn't exactly the case over the last couple of years at home. So they earned this mark by being the best batting team in trickier conditions. And what about if we throw run rate in there as well? Obviously England tops this, and that is with them only playing half a season of baseball. But you can see that Australia also scored at a very decent clip all the way through. They were in complete control when it came to the bat. And this is a pretty good effort from a team that started with Joe Burns opening for them. Australia had four batters averaging more than 50 in this cycle. It's fair to say that these four did the heavy lifting, but they did make so many runs that they covered up for Warner's drop and Green's development. Kerry did fine for a keeper, and Green was not terrible for your number six, especially for one who can bowl. So it meant that Warner was really the only player under par. Well, they aren't the best team here. They're actually the third best when it comes to average. But it is about even for those top three if you have a look. And the drop-off behind them is pretty steep as well. Essentially, three teams could bowl, and Australia was one of them. When you bring in the economy as well, I think that Australia and India certainly separate themselves from South Africa here. Especially considering that Australia is usually a pretty fast-scoring country. So you could actually give the edge to Australia here, but they're certainly in the top two. And they did all this with Hazelwood playing only four tests. Someone who can help with economy and average both pretty well. They had four bowlers with a better than 30 average. Doing that without Hazelwood is quite an achievement. Obviously, our friend Wobble Ball played a part, but Stark was very good as well. And because this almost never happened, should we give Nathan Lyon his flower? I think there was a natural anger and overcorrection at Nathan Lyon being called a goat, even if it was obviously a little bit sarcastic and about the fact that Australia had never had an offie anything like him before. But in almost every calendar year of Test cricket, Lyon is near the top of the wickets table. This cycle is not just on top, but massively so. And part of this is because he played so much in Asia. But Lyon always gets wickets, almost every year, and he virtually never gets injured. He never has flashy numbers when it comes to averages, but this man buys his wickets in bulk. And knowing you have him means that you get plenty of overseas, decent economy, and a collection of wickets throughout the game and all around the world. But if you look at Australia overall, when factory in batting versus bowling, there are only four positive teams in terms of this. But really, there was India, with a healthy five-run buffer of making runs compared to allowing them. And then there is Australia, who were more than twice as good as the second-best team. That is a very dramatic difference. And of course, these numbers hold up pretty well when you look at their win-loss ratio as well. You can argue they had some luck in the regular season games in the final itself. I don't think you can mount a case that they weren't the best team in this cycle. The interesting thing is how many players stood up for this tournament, despite the fact that they weren't stars. I mean, it is possible that before he was picked for Australia, Todd Murphy did not exist. He didn't have a huge impact on this final win, but he certainly played a part when he was going to India, especially as someone who looked like he'd been hired as the social media intern. That he did so well was not usually how young Aussie spinners go on debut. And I don't know what comeback number Usman Khawaja is on now, but it's been an awfully long journey. While he didn't do much in this final, he'd been open the batting from basically both ends to cover from Warner in this cycle. I remember all the way back when he made 37 and the world went crazy. That was so long ago, and there is certainly a chance of a retirement not too far off for him. But even for a player known to go on a run, this was the best we had seen of Osman Khawaja. To be the best batter over this period from starting outside the team is certainly some effort. And the second best was Head. Those two starring with Manus continuing to make runs and Smith bouncing back a little bit was huge. However, for Head, this must feel absolutely monumental. And let's be honest, Head did have massive issues in Asia and England not that long ago. And he seems to have improved a lot then. And chances are, he feels like he's conquered it. But his real importance to Australia is not just the amount of runs he made, which were pretty good, but the speed of them. With Warner slowing down and Carey more of a cameo guy, Head was their chief enforcer. And if you have a look at this, only Rishabh Pant had the same kind of impact that Head did. Obviously, next cycle, there'll be a couple of English players up there with them as well. But Head's ability to change the game's conversation came in handy right across the season and obviously in the final itself. And one day, I will eventually stop showing you this graphic. But only when Scott Bowler isn't the greatest anomaly we've had since Mike Hussey. Because at the moment, how can I not show you that he still has the third best bowling average in the history of our sport? Minimum 30 wickets. I mean, it's stupid, right? So whether or not he's the third best bowler in our game is debatable, although probably not. But think about what he is for Australia right now. He's certainly the third best bowler they have. 
So with Hazelwood out, this 32-year-old first-class seamer stepped up and has become a destroyer of worlds. And lastly, coming straight out of the giant WA all-rounder factory, we have Cameron Green. On the face of it, his numbers are just okay. But if you have a look at average difference, he has a plus eight mark. I still think there's plenty of work to be done on his batting and his bowling. However, Australia would take a career of 36 batting average and 29 bowling average especially if it's on a decent amount of usage. Even this development version of Green changed the Australian side. For the first time since Watto's hamstring went tight, Australia had some semblance of balance. They'll still be dreaming of Green becoming Keith Miller Mark II, but any team with common skill and Lions wickets is in such a more powerful position when you have a fifth bowling option to pair them with. And just think of all those players I just mentioned there. An offie no one had ever heard of, two batters that were dropped or left out of the team at time, a seamer they ignored for a decade, and an all-rounder that they had almost given up looking for. And in that, we haven't mentioned Cummins, Smith, Warner, and Stark. This was a good team in the previous cycle, but in this one, almost everything that they tried worked. They're a Josh Hazelwood clean bill of health from having a perfect WTC. And their biggest issue right now is buying a larger trophy case and trying to work out how to use the mace in any drinking-related fun. They own nine ICC men's titles. I think there's another 13 of the women, and I don't have the numbers on how many of their disability teams have won as well, but I'm assuming there's a few more there as well. No matter how you look at it, Australian cricket is the winningest nation of winners to ever win. Death, taxes, Australia win a trophy. Ah, may sing.